Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Quentin Ring and I am the director of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. And we are thrilled to have with us tonight uh, two incredible poets, Puma Pearl and Iris Berry. They are both celebrating new books. Um, thrilled to have them, especially glad um, to be uh, launching uh, sort of on the West Coast, Puma Pearl's book, um, Birthdays Before and After, which we published um, back in 2019, and we've been planning to have an event around it for a while. Um, in case you might have heard, there has been a global pandemic that intervened. So it's just a real pleasure to have both of them here. Um, I'll say more about them in a minute. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. Um, to begin with, I would like to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. Beyond Baroque, as many of you know, is a literary space in Venice, California, and we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing and presenting contemporary literature and art. We've been closed to the public uh, for the duration of the pandemic, um, but we did have our very first public event in our space this past Saturday. That was the opening of our current show in our Mike Kelly Gallery. It's called Polina PV, Ethereum Channeler. Um, that show will be viewable by appointment until July 31st. Uh, I highly encourage you to check it out. Polina was a 20th century minimist painter who painted with uh, what she saw as the aid of a post-gender astrocultural entity that she knew as Lacamo. Um, the paintings are stunning. Um, I really do come by to check them out. It's like I said, the gallery is open by appointment only. Um, Beyond that, pretty much all of our programming will remain virtual through the summer. Um, we offer a wide variety of workshops, readings, performances. Um, we are taking the summer uh, to trying to make the most of it to concentrate on making renovations and repairs to our space prior to reopening sometime in September. Um, so we will keep folks posted as to the exact date of our reopening. Um, but in the meantime, most of what we're gonna be doing is gonna be online, maybe with a few live events scattered here and there. Um, we do have a reading coming up on June 30th with Will Alexander and Brenda Ejima. We'll have more details about that for you shortly. Uh, additionally, right now, we have our ongoing free weekly workshops. Uh, on Wednesdays, we have poetry, uh, free weekly poetry workshop with Louis Vett Resto. And on Mondays, we have fiction with Raquel Baker. You can check those out at beyondbaroque.org. Um, as we do look towards reopening, uh, we are very much in need of financial support to help us prep our space and sustain our programming. Um, as, a re as a result, I'd be incredibly grateful if you consider making a donation to Beyond Baroque via the chat in the link or via our website, beyondbaroque.org. Um, and I just want to say, I'm, as, I, you know, as I already did, but I'm especially excited to be able to present uh, Puma and Iris tonight. Um, as I said, this is a reading we've been wanting to have for a long time. Um, I think they're really two of the country's great punk rock, po punk rock poets and writers. Um, Iris is the co-founder of Punk Hostage Press, she, um, which put out some incredible books. Um, she's been a friend of Beyond Baroque for a long time, um, even serving on our board um, not too long ago. That's how I first got to know her. Um, and she's just a great writer and she has a new book out, which I'm, I'm just so glad uh, this out in the world. Um, and meanwhile, Beyond Baroque was uh, incredibly proud to publish Puma's birthdays before and after uh, back in 2019. Um, it's an incredible book. Uh, I've been wanting to hear, to read it, hear her read it from, from it for a long time. Um, and I just really enjoyed working both of them over the past few years. Um, I should also say that Iris edited before, birthdays before and after. Um, so this is very much a, you know, a, a, a collaborative um, you know, program we're putting on. Um, Beyond Baroque has a long, long history with punk and poetry. Um, it goes all the way back to the 1970s when John Cervenka met John Doe in our Wednesday night poetry workshop um, that resulted in the band X forming. So I really think of this program as a continuation of that lineage. Um, and it's just great to have them both here. Um, I'll do the, I'll give their, their formal uh, bios just to introduce them a little bit more. Uh, Puma Pearl is a poet, writer, performer, and producer. She's the author of two chat books, Ruby True and Belinda and Her Friends, and three full-length poetry collections, Knuckle Tattoos, Retrograde, and Birthdays Before and After. She was the creator, curator, and host of Puma's Pandemonium, which brings spoken word together with rock and roll. As Puma Pearl and Friends, she performs regularly with a group of excellent musicians. She's received three awards from the New York Press Association in recognition of her journalism, 
and was the recipient of the 2016 Acker Award in the category of writing. She recently curated and performed in four shows as part of the Howl Happening Artist in Residence program. Iris Berry is the author and editor of several books and has a vast fan base for her unique voice and formidable writing style. She's an LA pop cultural historian, actress, and musician. She's appeared in numerous films, TV commercials, documentaries, and iconic rock videos. 1980s and 90s, she sang, performed, wrote songs, and recorded with the Lame Flames, the Ringling Sisters, the Dickies, the Flesh Eaters, and Pink Sabbath. She served four years on the board of directors for Beyond Broke Literary Arts Center. In 2009, she received her second Certificate of Merit Award from the City of Los Angeles for her contribution as a Los Angeles writer and for extensive charity work. Iris is the co-founder of her imprint, Punk Hostage Press, where she continues to champion and ab advocate for original voices. Um, I also want to mention that uh, we have books for sale for, uh, for Iris and for Puma. Um, please support them by purchasing a book, uh, purchasing their books. Um, if you'd like to purchase those from Beyond Baroque's bookstore, you're welcome to make an appointment. We are open by appointment for the rest of the summer, or you can get in touch with us directly. Otherwise, you know, see the link in the chat to get both of their books. So Iris, Puma, um, so glad to have you here. We're going to start off with Iris. Uh, and without further ado, please welcome Iris Berry. Hey, Quentin. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. And, you know, I just want to say that, um, you know, you talked about John and Xene meeting here. And I remember that. I remember loving the band and hearing about that. And I was like, I've got to get to that place beyond broke. And I, you know, I went and, um, I just thought, you know, one day, maybe, <laughs> maybe one day I'll get to read there. I'll get to read my writing. And, you know, I've had so much interaction with Beyond Baroque. I love Beyond Baroque. I'm so grateful that, you know, you've kept it going. And I, it's, you know, it's just a really phenomenal place where you guys have supported me and my press and so many other writers and Puma. And, um, you know, when I was, I don't know, 19 and, I was thinking about one day I'm going to read it beyond broke. I didn't think it would be from my bedroom on a webinar, but you know what we, this is how we do, this is what we do. And we're just going to keep doing it. And it's pretty, pretty damn beautiful. And I'm really honored to be here. Um, I, I'm going to read from my book, all that shines under the Hollywood sign. And, you know, this is a real treat for Puma and I, because we were supposed to do, you know, her book came out birthdays before and after, which I was honored to edit and my book, and we were supposed to do readings together and we just didn't get to. So here we are, and I'm grateful, and I'm so happy you're all here. So let's, uh, I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you there. Standing directly in front of the Hollywood sign, I could feel its majestic pull, all nine letters, each one 45 feet tall and 30 feet wide, built in 1923, an 18 month ad campaign that's lasted 98 years and counting. It's taken on a life of its own, promising many things to many people. All I ever wanted from it is to just sit there and look good. And it's never let me down. You know, um, the whole point of writing All That Shines Under the Hollywood Sign is because, you know, people come to Hollywood and Los Angeles from all over the world. And it means different things to different people. And so my book is, letting you all know what it means to me. And this is my Hollywood. So I'll read the title poem. It's called All That Shines Under the Hollywood Sign. Being a native Angelino, no matter where I've gone and where I go, Pacoima, Encino, or San Marino, Hollywood looms large and its reach is long and powerful. The names of famous streets are forever imprinted into my memory bank seeing them in my everyday life on TV, in the movies, and hearing their names and songs. Topanga Canyon, Laurel Canyon, Van Nuys Boulevard, Hollywood and Vine, Sunset and Vine, the Sunset Strip and Mulholland Drive. People come here from all over the world knowing the names of these streets and boulevards. Taking the 101 freeway and seeing those famous street names on off ramps is like a visual roll call where each one of the street names could have their own IMDb page. When I was 16 and I cut school, instead of running off with my friends to get high in their parents' garage, I'd take a drive to Venice Beach leisurely and without traffic. If I didn't take Topanga Canyon, I'd go through Hollywood, take the Sunset Strip all the way to PCH, and find my way to the Venice Boardwalk. 
when it was still soaked with the perfect blend of the 1950s beat era and 1960s and 70s hippie cultures with a big dose of Bob Dylan and Jim Morrison. I met some of the most important and talented people performing on that boardwalk. But before I'd hit the beach, I'd stop off at Schwab's drugstore on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard, Sunset Boulevard and Laurel Canyon, buy myself some breakfast with a front row seat at the counter, watching all the actors, musicians and all kinds of characters come and go. Most of them would find a way to talk to me. I was young and bright eyed with a purse full of stolen red lipstick from the makeup counter. Some of them offered to discover me. Some of them wanted to keep me. This was a time before milk cartons, the internet and investigative television, but I still knew better. Schwab's is gone now with, uh, with so many other Hollywood landmarks. And even though I was only 16, I knew at the time how incredible it was. So before I'd leave Schwab's for the beach, I'd make a stop at those regal wood phone booths in the back. I'd close the door and the light would go on. And I'd call my brother and I'd say to him, guess where I am? Okay. You know, I do believe my friend Nikki McMahon is here. And if you are, this is for you. This is called Thank You, Henry Mancini. Thank you, Henry Mancini, for all the neon boulevards and all the city streets of all the cities and the jazz and the poetry of the downtowns and the uptowns. For Sunset Boulevard in the rain and Hollywood Boulevard at twilight, Wilshire Boulevard at dawn. For the Pacific Coast Highway, Union Station, and the view from Mulholland Drive, both sides the San Fernando Valley and Los Angeles. For jazz gliding its way down translucent highways at one in the morning through the steam of car headlights in the pouring rain. For making me feel clean when I was dirty and for the fantasy that my life was somehow better than it was. And for the romance when there wasn't any. For crazy but surprisingly smooth hungover mornings when an all-nighter should have been painful. Thank you for the lengthy warm Santa Ana summer afternoons, overlooking a city from a dingy apartment with only the view and you to save me. Thank you, Henry Mancini, for those ephemeral evenings draped across Hollywood at midnight, like a ghost town, timeless, glamorous, and still, for the exquisite and the calm, and for the clean and regal lift of elegance onto a stairway of stars, leading to a luxurious and illustrious world where nothing earthly can touch me. Thank you. I'm basically taking you on a tour of Los Angeles. This is called LA River Lullaby. And I want to dedicate this to Michelle McDonald. I wrote this for her. It's 2.06 AM. I can hear the sounds of a distant train as the constant passing of cars drive the Fry Freeway alongside the LA River, heading north and heading south, going to places called home. Home for me is not a place with walls, windows and doors, or framed photographs are placed on mantles or over fireplaces and lined hallways or embedded in refrigerator magnets. Home lives in my heart and in my breath and in the unsaid exchange of knowing glimpses with loved ones and kindred spirits, ignited by the reciprocity of trust kindness, safety, love, and the generosity of a spirit that goes beyond material items, beyond coaxing words and gestures for planned outcomes, beyond exchange of anything wanted or needed. Home is not the room for the life, but for the life in the room. Home lives in the conversations that our souls are having with each other without words, where truths are unspoken with an unconditional love that rings louder and with more power than mere words could ever express with an emanating everlasting unstoppable force. Home is where the heart thrives. As the passing cars on the five freeway get quieter and quieter until all I can hear is the distant train and the unspoken words. All right, this is called, um, you know, I also wanna say that my book was illustrated, illustrated by Scott Eicher. Um, I'm seeing messages, sorry, really nice ones. Uh, Scott Eicher illustrated my book. He's a phenomenal artist. And, um, you know, here's one that he did. It's, it's, I think you could see it. It's 
of uh, Man's Chinese Theater. It's incredible. Um, all right, so that this piece is called Shooting for the Stars in Kevlar. We, we run from hot summer days and broken air conditioners. We run to chilled movie theaters, make out like teenagers who've never had sex, never been kissed by tender mouths and never cradled in the arms of an unconditional love. We make our own movies back in the back of the theater, laughing like there's no yesterday, yesterdays that begged us to stay and try to kill us in our sleep, then chased us in our waking hours, begging for salvation in the hall pass. We are the bright spots in the road found in dark alleys, a pair of lives lived hard, treated hard, and discarded harder. And as we hit the pavement skipping, we forgot that we were only playing hopscotch to the tune of songs led by a symphony of sirens and howling dogs. Can we believe that we can believe in love after we have let so many put their unloving hands around our hearts, souls, and throats? ex-friends, ex-loves, ex-drug habits, ex-drug dealers, still trying to strike a better deal with empty promises, empty pockets, and empty souls, leaving open wounds like bullet holes as the winds blow through them, hollowed and scarred, and sometimes, most often, are unhealable. A catalog of catastrophic events shaped our lives and sculpted us into who we are. It doesn't always mean that who we are can carry us into who we want to be but that doesn't mean we'll stop trying as we dry our eyes while no one's looking in dark theaters waiting for the next movie to start. All right, um, this is called The Ghosts of Punk Rock Past. The first time we met was on a Saturday night in 1978 or 79, I don't remember. He was running down Sunset Boulevard with about five other people. They were all covered in peanut butter. He stopped right in front of me and sweetly said, we're smearing peanut butter all over ourselves. You wanna do it with us? My friends were horrified and pulled me away. I was intrigued. About a year later, we were in his apartment on Cherimoya and Franklin, which was literally in the shadow of the Hollywood sign. There was about 10 kittens running around and bouncing off walls. It was a flying cat circus. He liked to say my name backwards. Hey Siri, give me your arm. And before I knew it, he grabbed my wrist and just as his lit cigarette was about to hit my skin, one of the kittens flew into us and knocked it out of his hands. The last time I saw him was at Okie Dog. It was about 2.30 in the morning. He was walking around saying goodbye to people one by one. And the next day, just like that, he was gone. Since then, there's been so many others. And I think about it, these encounters, brief and fleeting and otherwise, these bonds, surreal and otherworldly in life as in death. These chance meetings, and I don't know what any of it means. I'm just glad we met. All right, I'm gonna end it with this. I'm gonna let you listen to Puma, um, but it's been such a, it's just so great. And I just so appreciate all of you and all these really great messages. I love you all too. This is called The Trouble with Palm Trees, part one. Palm trees standing gorgeous, erect and regal. They call to me, they whisper things to each other. They glisten in the hot California sun. They promise many things to many people, fame, fortune, love, sweet summer romance. Somehow all I ever got from them is they're nice to look at and they've never failed me. The trouble with palm trees part two. The problem with palm trees is there's nothing practicable about them. They offer no shade in the summer and no warmth in the winter. They just look good. How perfect for California. All right, this has been a real dream. Thank you so much. And I look forward to listening to Puma. It was an honor being here and it was an honor editing her book. I, I honestly have to say that if I didn't edit Birthdays Before and After, there might not be an All That Shines Under the Hollywood sign. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Puma. Okay. So, um, so I guess I was, uh, I was already introduced, so here I go. But first I wanna say how 
glad I am to be here with Iris and Quentin and Jimmy Beyond Baroque and LA and Punk Hostage Press all became second homes for me. They um, supported me in so many ways. And this book, oh, here's the book. The artwork is by my brilliant friend, Shell Mayer. And it came out conveniently right before the pandemic. And Iris did such a wonderful job editing. And it proves it by the reading that I'm about to do, because I was thinking, when am I going to read? I want to read some summer poems. So where are my summer poems? And then I remembered that Iris, as my editor, had the insight to see this book in terms of the seasons and the way the poems followed one another. I knew it was going from a birthday one year to the next year, but at like, a brilliant editor does, she saw what I was unable to see. So I'm going to start with a poem called Memorial Day Morning. I woke up dreaming. We sat in a window booth drinking whiskey, looking out on the dark street. Night turned to afternoon, a table in an Italian place on Court Street, or maybe the hole in the wall Mexican giant fish tacos and margaritas, always random and deserted, wears off like heroin. And I'm left listening to Lucinda on another holiday morning, more dark coffee, one part longing, one part regret. The night before, it may have rained, I walked, no hat, no umbrella, no romance, just the smell of wet dog and muddy pavements. There is no Lucinda without heartbreak. The taste of bourbon and cigars lingers like memory. Today is a New York holiday. The transplants are gone. Streets are deserted and promise nothing. Neither do we. Unlike the streets, we are not empty. Two parts longing, one part regret. Shooting normal. So many pictures of normal. Arcs, lives, houses. It's 3.37 a.m. and everything is broken and it's too late to get Diva the wonder dog. Every time you leave, I walk with her. Now she's asleep in her dog bed surrounded by toys. Shots of tequila lined up on the bar. I love the formation. Daylight, a good time to forget the moment and talk of regret, last chances. No boats, no decks, no Christmas parties, no mothers, no fathers, nobody's arms in the air in my photos. No normal, just broken. We sit on bar stools and remember how it felt when the subway door closed. Your kid left behind, standing alone on the platform. Ox and houses, normal for those who matter. I'm still the girl you wanted to fuck on the football field. In my school, we had no fields, no proms, no clubs, just cigarettes on the back of the bus in Coney Island street corners. Normal people sit on couches, eat at tables, kids drink milk. I sipped my morning coffee, ate my cheese Danish, and walked down the block to third grade purgatory. It's 3.55 a.m., too late to get the dog. She's sleeping and everything is broken. Water bursts through walls, pictures fall, broken dreams of missed connections, airports, fences, floods, bicycle wheels stuck in the mud. It's too early to get the dog. What kind of woman? What kind of woman could resist a man who tastes like a margarita? Possibly most women. I wish I were most women my life. I don't know how I got here. Windows and doors remain unlocked. It no longer matters. I want to stay and I want to go, always. We linger outside bars and clubs and everybody says goodnight and nobody leaves. I wore an Indian print dress to my wedding, a fake ring to rent an apartment, 
tenth and B across the DMZ. Purple walls in the bedroom, bathtub in the kitchen, windows watching buildings turn to dope spots. The baby tossed in his crib. The bus rattled the dishes. The doorbell didn't work. The floor leaned to the east. I nailed a cabinet to the wall, put up fake sea blue tiles above the sink and magic jungle wallpaper for the baby. We had an air conditioner that didn't work, a rocking chair, an old gold couch. The streets called. What kind of woman doesn't want a loyal, hardworking husband? The baby never slept at night. The husband always phoned during our afternoon nap. He set the alarm each weekday morning to WCBS and smoked two cigarettes and went to work. On Sundays, he wore his blue terry cloth robe, watched Kojak, showered, shaved, went to bed early so he'd be rested enough to work another week. He had routines. What kind of woman doesn't want a baby's father with routines? We were the only couple in the park. All of the other mothers had welfare cases and missing fathers. What kind of woman wants a welfare case? What kind of woman smashes her jewelry in a rage? What kind of woman writes poems and burns them in the kitchen sink? What kind of woman stops nursing a baby so she can shoot dope? What kind of woman? What kind of woman can't resist the taste of a margarita? Loves men with OCD and a touch of bipolarity. What kind of woman? The kind of woman who fucks in cars and sleeps alone. The kind of woman men always want and never keep. The kind of woman who always leaves first. The kind of woman whose sex partners are on her boyfriends and whose boyfriends are on her sex partners. A very important kind of woman who doesn't matter to anyone. A woman who knows where the moment is but loses the years. A woman with a bad decision. A left turn that never went right. A woman who can't resist the taste of a margarita, who writes the script before the story start, who wears secrets like lockets around her bare neck, who hides in parks and libraries and subway cars. What kind of woman are you, she's asked. A woman with a taste for a margarita. The taste of rebellion. What did your rebellion taste like? Mine tasted like long haired boys, sounded like 4 a.m. rock and roll, felt like the bottom of my mother's staircase after she kicked me out for coming home too late. My rebellion tasted of not going back, smelled like $34 in my wallet, dug into me like the knife resting in the sheath on my hip the day I changed my name to Puma, just like my knife. My rebellion felt like never going home. Feelings began in my legs, exploded like the orgasms I never even had yet. Smelled like pot and silk scarves burning shade on light bulbs. Looked like paisley, reds and blues melting on purple. Sounded like Jimmy and Janice before they reached 27 and draped the Fillmore in black. Nobody witnessed my rebellion. Everybody caught up in their own. My family had already labeled me crazy, hopeless, a lost cause, a loser nobody would love. And they were wrong and they were right. His rebellion was dropping out of Bronx science, hiding a gun in his bureau, black jeans so tight, he customized them with slits up the calf and could hardly walk up the five flights leading to our 10th street apartment with a police lock, the brick wall, the loft bed, the bathtub in the kitchen where we lived in our shared rebellion. Our rebellion was his criminality, my welfare, our books and music, the dog he called Stag Lee, nights in Tompkins Square Park, days on St. Mark's Place, armed, love, cigarettes, leather jackets. My surrender was to heroin, his was to money. A baby born in the middle of our disintegration, his rebellion would be raves, speed, cars, girls, and survival. 
The drugs are gone. Saga Lee was stolen from outside the bodega and his owner's life surrendered to the gun held in his own hand. My rebellion is quiet and solitary. Broken down Tuesdays in hot summer days when life seems to go on too long. Today is Wednesday, July 4th. Fireworks, but no celebration. I order Chinese food and search for a black and white movie. If new culture and tracks can be found, maybe there's still some hope for rebellion without surrender. Used car love. This was written with thoughts of Anthony Bourdain. You say you had a lot of love. I say I have a lot of cars and cheap hotel rooms. You had a few hotel rooms, but yours were classier, overlooking parks and mountains. Your love had views. My love had brick walls, Bukowski vibes, and stained towels. The cars were cleaner. I've always had a preference for two-door models, their sleek exterior and sneaky legroom. Lives lived on different planets, family, dinner conversations, and hieroglyphics. Love is a foreign country, excavations, ridge walking, landing on Delancey. In the end, I catch you alone. You seem smaller and a little scared, unprepared. For me, it doesn't matter. I've got a foothold on the other side, waiting on the corner in the dope dealer's boots. Buildings looming. Even your vision is distorted. We live in shadows. You say you had a lot of love. I say I had a lot of cars, but don't pity me. I always like to drive. It's not depression. It's August. City thunderstorms take a brief respite as the sun sets on Charlie Parker and the park stills while the surging moon rises. Last full moon of summer. Strings of 90 degree days have gone into hiding. I'm considering a day at the beach when the heat returns, pressing in like jailhouse grilled cheese. I walk downtown streets and wear black. The temperature shoots up towards 100. September is cooler, but brings another birthday, and I've already had so many. Why do I need more? Why do I need more of anything? I have enough pairs of boots and black jeans. If only the black wouldn't fade. If only I wouldn't fade and stay the same or better, or even in a holding pattern of mind and body and acceptance. I won't be rich or famous. I won't be beautiful or loved. I won't even be dead. Why do we need August anyway? It's like a bad play that never ends. No exit scored by the eagles. Nothing good happens in August. My hair sticks to my forehead. I look goofy in pictures and decide to give up smiling, which won't be difficult. Maybe give up talking too. And opinions and thoughts. Nobody wants thoughts. Somebody told me who I wasn't yesterday and somebody else told me who I was. A third defined gentrification and a fourth explained what a corporation means. Why bother to talk at all? People's intelligence rises as temperatures fall. Look for me in February. I'll be wearing boots and black jeans, just like August, but smarter. It was a beautiful summer. These are my references. This is what beautiful means. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Vonnegut. You're so beautiful it hurts to look at you. Rayanne Graff to Angela Chase, my so-called life. She was drunk, but she was definitely correct. Sometimes it's so beautiful it hurts, different than hot coffee and clarity and an absence of pain, different from how you thought it could be, whatever would be, one last time, the third, second wave. Filthy words tumbling between the lips of your beautiful mouth, Lucinda Williams. Beauty, every morning, lift the shades, sky hurting when it looks at you, your river on your mean mouth crumbling like those filthy words. 
every morning it hurts to look at you. How do the New York City summer breeze just through our lives? I remember as a kid, the backs of my knees sticking to wicker subway seats. I remember my railroad apartment, my room facing the F train, no air worthy of breathing. This summer, every morning, I opened the shades, bridges, rivers, trees hurting more than the ugly. How are we deserving as we laugh and pose and drink and lose, play music, write poems? It still hurts. Write more poems. It hurts. It still hurts. Write poems. It hurts. Danny says it's the new moon. Cynthia says, fuck the moon. He reached so beautiful, it hurts to look at you. Why didn't, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think of that? I'm quoting an adolescent angst show that I remember more clearly than my own life. Jordan Castellano leaning against walls, Ricky Vasquez applying eyeliner in the girls' room, and Ryan fucking the wrong people and forgetting when to come in on Ramon songs. We are never Angela walking tightropes, bouncing higher, raising shades to the sun. You're so beautiful, it hurts. I run away as Lucinda's words tumble through my mind. Vonnegut was right and wrong. I write more poems. I'd rather walk the dog. There must be a reason for this relentless beauty. Every morning I raise the shades and it's still too beautiful not to hurt a little more. Just that tiny bit more that is more than you can stand. You close your eyes, you raise the shades, you write a song, you write a poem. Fuck the moon, beautiful summer. You're a good left hook, beautiful summer. I give up. Raise the shades in the morning, it hurts to look. You're so beautiful, it hurts to look away. I'm gonna end. My last poem is the first poem in the book and it was dedicated to the most wonderful day and the most wonderful people that I fell in love with on those days of the beast walk <laughs> when I met Iris and Razor for the first time in actual real life. And it's called The Most Perfect Day. What was the best day of your life? Louis says it was the day I took him to a double feature on 40 Deuce. Indiana Jones and the Warriors. My mother used to say it was the day she had a baby, me. Unfortunately, it went rapidly downhill from there. Julia told me it was the first time she saw Jay-Z, a day filled with boys, friends, hip hop, and alcohol. Annie would choose a day of pickup trucks, shotguns, and stone drunk love. The first time I met Lee McRevin, was one of those days. It was during the beast crawl, toxic abatement, razor through a barbecue. My rock and roll LA friend tried to talk me out of going. Go hang out in the hate, he advised. Go to Amoeba Records, go to Golden Gate Park. Why do you wanna hang out with a bunch of poets, he demanded. Separate yourself. You're a star, you're from New York. He finally stopped talking. Then he wanted to have phone sex. His ignorant snobbery had eliminated all chances. Iris called me at my crack house motel in San Pablo, the Berkeley Inn. You're coming, she said, I'll go get you. My West Coast sister, whom I'd never seen in person. Jason called, a writer friend going back to my old MySpace days. We'd never met in person either. Wait for me, I'll pick you up. An hour later, Jason and his Colorado skater buddy pulled up to the crack house parking lot, backed the rental car into a telephone pole, and we were off. We were off. A backyard filled with punks and poets, flowers, a barbecue pit, tree trays overflowing with food, back steps leading into the house. Iris and I sat on those steps and took a picture. Razor bought a book, he insisted. Support the traveling poets, he said. I'd found my tribe. Someone knocked at the gate. I opened it. Bucky Sinister. Punks and elephants, a favorite quotation of mine. I walked into the kitchen to get a cool drink of water. 
the most beautiful man I'd ever seen stood at the sink washing dishes, Lee McGrevin. I've seen many beautiful men before and since, but none so unexpectedly and none of them were washing dishes. Later, we all walked down to the deck of a nearby restaurant and shared the best poetry reading in the immediate universe, the best and the most beautiful. The temperature dropped and we ended the evening around the bonfire telling old stories, sharing wounds. We found the flames. I photographed his knuckle tattoos, lost soul. Somehow we got on the subject of the Tompkins Square Park cannibal who was allegedly chopped up his girlfriend and fed it to the homeless. The motive seemed to be the same as your average developer. She had a rent controlled apartment on 9th Street and she was sick of him hanging around. Razor expressed some doubts about the veracity of the story. He lived in the park back then, ran the kitchen, and he swore those stews were vegetarian. The next day, Bill Gaynor read a poem about our evening. All I remember is the line. And then they started talking about eating people. The morning after Lee died, I went to the gym. I braced myself against the bars and did more leg ups than ever before. It's always the things you don't brace yourself for, I thought, staring at nothing as I rose and fell, rose and fell, rose and fell. The needle and the damage done came up on iPod shuffle. Should have been a perfect day, but I guess the angels had their hands full and were too busy to properly program my music that morning. But still, it should have been a perfect day could have been the best day of my life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Quentin, for putting this together. Iris, Jimmy, love you all. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. That was, or thank you, Puma. That was killer. I just uh, absolutely loved it. And thank you, Iris, too. Uh, come on back on screen, Iris, if you want to. Um, come back, Iris. Yeah. We just want to leave it open for a sec. If anybody has any questions or comments, you know, just put them in the chat. And uh, if anybody has a question for Iris or Puma, you know, we'd love to hear from you. But um, I just, I thought that was killer. Like I said, I, I just love both of those so much. Yeah, Puma, that was awesome. I love that. You were awesome too, Iris. I was cry I'm crying from the last piece. Well, that's the piece that always makes us cry. <laughs> I got through um, it without crying. <laughs> um, impressed. Um, I did want to say, you know, thank you to both of you. I want to say thank you to our audience for being here. Um, it's great to have some friendly names in the chat um, commenting. And I also want to give a special thanks to Jimmy Vega, who's uh, the man behind the scenes for running everything this evening. Um, as always, he's been great. Um, Thank you, Jimmy. So yeah, just uh, a lot of love for, for everyone here. And, um, you know, Puma, hopefully we'll get you out here to read uh, in person in a few days. Um, we'll be open in September. And um, until then, thanks everyone for coming. And um, yeah, just uh, buy, buy Puma's book, buy Iris's book, um, and hope to see you all live and in person sooner rather than later. So thanks everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you so much, everyone. Thank you.